This power is not just power to heal the sick, although that's powerful. It's not just power to get a, a, a gifting from the Lord to propel his work on earth. This power is also power to be set free. So let's, let's go to Acts 1.8. We'll pull, up, pull this up. Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit to his disciples, and he's describing the Holy Spirit. He says this, you will receive power. Everyone say power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, power is not the Holy Spirit. It's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. It is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. When, when, uh, when people are getting touched by the Lord, I don't know if Randy went into this, but I'm just going to go through it a little bit. When people get touched by the Lord and they fall down, I can't tell whether it's the Lord or not. I hope it's the Lord. I think it's the Lord. I might have 10 people laying all in a row, shaking and baking, rocking and rolling. And they say, you know, some people might say, hey, Paul, you know, you know, some of the things that happen in these meetings, you know, it's the devil, I think. I said, well, when when Jesus shows up, demons tremble. I mean, that should happen. And sometimes it's not God. I said, well, a lot of people, you know, there's there's people who are who are broken and, and, and they're still looking for healing in their emotions. And you know what? Yeah, some of it might be the flesh, of course. But a lot of it's God. But I don't judge it by the manifestation See, Jesus says, you will know them by their fruit, not their roots. Did, you, did, did Randy talk about this at all? He did? No. Yes, no. No, no? Okay. All right, so, so when we see something happening, maybe somebody's trembling. Maybe somebody's laughing. Maybe somebody's rolling. Maybe some, a bunch of people fell down. Maybe some of this stuff is offensive. You're like, man, I'm really getting offended here. My religious spirit is like really... Uh, I'm just kidding. So, but, you know, it's... I don't judge it by what, what they're manifesting. I see this. Do they love more when they get up? Do they have more patience are they evangelizing? Is there people getting touched through their life? Are they actually, is the Holy Spirit manifesting in their life? Then I go, man, what happened down there? Woo! That was the Lord. This power is not just power to heal the sick, although that's powerful. It's not just power to get a, a, a gifting from the Lord to propel his work on earth. This power is also power to be set free. I love uh, George Whitfield. I studied uh, uh, George Whitfield. In, uh, in getting my Master's of Divinity, and, uh, and he has just an amazing story. He worked with, uh, he actually went to Oxford, uh, just a little bit younger than Charles and John Wesley. Charles and John Wesley were the um, uh, ones who started the Methodist movement out of the Anglican movement, um, and, and they were just revivalists. And George Whitfield is one of the only people who had a transatlantic revival. He had a, a revival in England. God was moving through his life in England, and he had a revival in the Americas when we were colonies. And uh, from Maine to Georgia, he would travel through the colonies, and, uh, and God was moving powerfully. Actually, I, I, I would read statements of George Whitfield's life and some of the fruit of his life, and he would, he would say this, uh, they would say this, that 20 to 30,000 people would be able to hear him at one time. Now, that's a supernatural happening. I mean, I, I speak on a microphone. I know what it's like. I know what it sounds like to try not to use a microphone. People can barely hear you. And so I can't imagine George Whitfield actually speaking in 20 to 30,000 people. It's hard for me to believe that because I know what it's like to not speak with a microphone and how hard it is for people to hear. Now, sometimes they would put him in a bell tower. Sometimes they would put him under a tree that was over a valley and the tree like kind of curved up and it kind of had this amphitheater effect. Um, but, you know, they would have stories where he would take John Wesley as he was preaching to the coal miners and the coal miners would come out and he would be preaching to them and you would, it, he talks about you would see the lines of the faces, the white lines as they were t crying in tears on these coal miner faces as they were giving their lives to Jesus. And so George, uh, one of the reasons why I do believe the reports of George Whitfield is because I was reading Ben Franklin's diary writing about George Whitfield. 
him and George Whitfield were friends. Did you know that? Ben Franklin never got saved, but wrote about how George really impressed him, how George and him, you know, disagreed on theology and God, but he couldn't deny the uh, example and the power of George Whitfield and his life. And he said when George went to Philadelphia, because that's where Ben Franklin lived, uh, Ben Franklin owned the papers there, he said that he would pace out while George is speaking. From the bell tower, he would pace out, and he reckons twenty to 30,000 people could hear him in one radius. It's powerful. George Whitfield talks about his own struggles. He, you could read his own personal diaries. George Whitfield talks about how he was in ministry school before, he, before this stuff happened. He was in ministry school. He loved the Lord. He was saved, but he had a problem in his life. He, he was, he subset, he was uh, 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 struggling with a sin in his life, and it was, like, it was like no matter what he did, he could not get set free. I would call that a stronghold. It wasn't that he didn't love Jesus. It was like for 90 some percent of his life, he was fine. But there was this little bitty part that no matter what happened, he couldn't get set free until he starts fasting and praying and fasting and praying. And Jesus talks about this. He says this, knock and the door will be open to you. Seek and you will find. Ask and you'll receive. It's a wonderful verse. And it's really in reference to the Holy Spirit. He also talks about a, a, a man who comes to his neighbor in the middle of the night begging for bread. And he said, wouldn't you just give him bread so he would go away? How much more will my heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask? But oftentimes that, that na- a knock, that ask, that seek, we think it's only singular. But actually the way the verbs are, it should be actual a plural or, or a continuation If you were to translate it properly, according to the latest commentaries, it's this. It would be this, it would be said this way in the Aramaic. Knock and keep on knocking. Seek and keep on seeking. Ask and keep on asking. And the door will be opened. And you will find. And you will receive. Too often we do this when it comes to the things of the Spirit. I guess he's not showing up today. When the reality, God expects us to do this. God, I need you. God, I want you. God, I can't, I can't not have you, God. I need more, God. God, I'm not, I'm not giving up until you give me that bread, God. God, I'm, I'm pressing in, God. God, I know you have more for me. I know there's breakthrough. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. And George Whitfield started knocking for freedom fasting and praying. And then he comes on holiday to take communion. During communion, he feels the presence of God come upon his body. And he no longer struggles with that sin anymore. He gets a freedom that only the Spirit could give. I know what it's like. I remember in my own life, When I got radically converted, I went all in for Jesus. But even in my own life, it was like I struggled in a certain area of my life and I couldn't get free. It wasn't that uh, I I love disciplines and I love, you know, uh, accountability and I love all the programs that we have. But it was like if I wasn't fighting every moment of every day, if I stopped, I failed. It was like it was demonically motivated temptation. And so I said, God, I know you have more for me. I know there's more than this for me. It wasn't that there wasn't temptation in my life. It was that I couldn't resist this temptation. It was too hard. So I started doing this. I started knocking. I started fasting and praying. I wasn't telling everybody. And in my bedroom, while I'm laying on my bed, I was still living with my parents at the time as an adult man. I don't know if you, if you heard my story before. I, I, uh, my wife had left me and I'd lost my children and I ended up being back in my parents' house. And I said, God, I know there's more. 
So I was peti- doing some t- petitionary prayer. I was just like, God, I just thank you for everything you've done in my life. I thank you for what you're doing. I'm asking that, you know, you provide for my family. Just standard types of prayer. All of a sudden, this energy comes on my body. I've never felt it before. Now, listen, there's been times I'm not a feeler type person. I'm not like sensitive in a lot of other ways that some of my friends are just, man, they're like little buckets. I mean, like they, they would walk in a room, they're like, whoo, the Holy Spirit's all over this place. I'm like, where? Where's he at? Is there, is there a fan going on? What's going on? What's, what, are you, what are you feeling? You know, like I'm not that, that person. I'm not designed that way. I wasn't, it was never, you know, I would feel the Holy Ghost goosebumps. Have you ever felt them where you're just like, hmm, God's here. I love it. I'm going to raise my hand now. Thank you. All right. Um, so I, uh, but, I, but normally that, you know, I've never felt any of these other things that, that uh, others had experienced. And in the middle of my pressing in and my seeking and my knocking, in the middle of my room, there was no keyboard playing with pads, you know, where, you know what I'm talking about, keyboardists. Okay. There was no smoke machine. There was no emotional help. I felt this surging coming through my body, up and down. And I started crying. And I was crying, and I was crying, and I was crying. Because I realized that God was touching me. And I started to do the Holy Ghost crunches that Randy talks about, where you're you're just constantly doing this, and, and, and it hurts. You know, I don't have abs they're down, they're, they're in there somewhere. And it, you know, I was sore the next day for 30, 30, 45 minutes. I'm doing the Holy Ghost crunches and, and, and I'm laughing. And, and, and I, and I told, <laughs> and I, listen, I grew up in a Pentecostal church and people cried when God moved. That was a normal response. When I heard uh, people were laughing, I thought that can't be God. God can make you cry. He can't make you laugh. I don't know why, it just made sense. I'm going to go on a rep chart real quick. My brother, he went out to, um, he's older than me, he's about seven years older than me, and he, he uh, got married and, um, and went out to California, and, um, and uh, he was telling me, I was telling him how, you know, God can't make people laugh. And he said, you know, Paul, um, Karen laughed once. I said, what, Karen? Now, Karen is his wife, and she is the sweetest little person I've ever met. She's just so sweet. She, you like, she's a super introvert. Like, if you talk to her, that's the only way she'll talk to you. She doesn't, like, talk to you without you first talking to her. She's an introvert. How many of you are introverts? How many know I'm talking? Yeah, you're not really introverts because she wouldn't have even raised her hand. It was a test. <laughs> an introvert really wouldn't have raised her hand, and I caught you all. Frauds. No, just kidding. So, so she wouldn't. She, this is the type of person she is. And I, I said, Karen laughed. He said, Karen laughed. I said, you got to tell me that story. And he said, that, he said we were at a church in uh in in uh california and we're listening to this uh visiting minister and he's did a wonderful wonderful uh uh sermon and we he had an altar call and we came forward we you know we grew up in a pentecostal church we knew how to assume the position you know he's down the line and he's you know he's going phil 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 never found phil but (laughs) phil no okay Phil? All right. So that's just a little joke. It's not true. It's just, sorry. Just keeping the mood light. And uh, my, my brother said he got to Karen and she fell down, which is not odd, uh, just not normal for Karen. So he's like, wife's getting touched. Yes, God, thank you, God, touching my wife. Thank you. You know, he didn't fall down and the guy kept going. And then she started crying. He's like, whoa, tears. God's moving powerfully. It's awesome. Thank you, God. Wailing. And then she started to laugh. And she was laughing and laughing and laughing. And my brother's like, huh? 
She wouldn't stop. She stayed there for the longest time. My brother starts to apologize for her. He's very embarrassed for her. He's like, I'm sorry. It's not my wife. She, the guy touched her and she fell. And I don't know what's happening. And, and you know, so I, you know, this isn't normal, you know, kind of thing. And, and, uh, and then, and, you know, she was the last one to get up. And, you know, the sound man, you know, flicks the lights. And uh, he's like, oh, man, I got to get her out. Okay. Uh, so he's, he said he had to carry her, like, like help her on her own. And she was walking and she couldn't, like, stand under her own power almost like she was uh, inebriated you know except not by wine and uh, and 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 he said that she was laughing and he puts her in the car and she's laughing and he puts her to bed and she's laughing and the next morning he's eating breakfast he's eating cereal at the kitchen table and she comes in and she's like wow last night was crazy and he's like yeah what happened And she's like, well, you know when the minister was looking for Phil? He said, yeah. He touched me, and I fell down. And I felt the, felt the presence of the Lord, and I just fell. And he goes, yeah, I saw that. And she goes, it was great. And then Jesus came in this vision, and he showed me a moment where I was significantly hurt. And I'm not going to explain the story to keep her details private, but a significant hurt in her life. And it was like he ripped it out and healed it. And this flood of tears just came. And she said, Anthony, I cried and cried and cried. But when I was done, it was like a flood of joy so filled me that I couldn't help but laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh. And when I heard that story, I thought, okay, God, you can make people laugh. We don't know what God's doing in people. You don't know. So uh, there I am, back to my story. I'm on my bed, and this electricity is flowing through me. Holy Ghost crunches. I'm crying. I'm laughing. I'm experiencing all the things I used to wander about. And then, and then, uh, and then I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking my mom's going to kick down the door because Italian mothers are a bit aggressive. If something's off, they're going to be like, you know, what's going on here? But uh, she didn't. She, she must not hurt me. But I was, I was just so enjoying the presence of God in my room. And I didn't know what God was doing. I didn't know in the moment what God was doing. But I just said, God, if this is you, just do what you need to do. But after that experience was the first time in my life I never struggled in that area again. It's not that I was never tempted, but I had the power to overcome that temptation. I had the power to say no. This power is also power to set you free. It's power to give you what you need. Jesus says that he will send the helper, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. The literal translation of paraclete is the one who comes alongside to give you what you need. I don't know if Randy talked about this. We overlap because I'm his spiritual son and we used to not speak in the same conference and now I am. So, but, but it means he gives you comfort for those who need comfort. He gives you help for those who need help. He gives you equipping for those who need equipping, power for those who need empowerment. Whatever you're going through, the Holy Spirit's here to give you what you need. And when he's speaking of the term another, it's a literal term. It doesn't mean like another, like um, this is one box and he's going to send another box. These are two different boxes. What another means is that this is one box and he's sending another box of the exact same thing. But now instead of it being on one person, the whole church gets filled. Do you understand? 